Thanks, Ellen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Showalter, a Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and I'm joining you from my home office. Today, you'll also hear from Dr. Laura Kalambakita, State Economist, and Britta Raytan, State Budget Director. We want to welcome you to MMB's first virtual forecast presentation. Little unusual. Uh, delivering November 2020 budget and economic forecast, which gives you up-to-date information on our state's budget, as well as new U.S. economic data from our consultants, IHS Market. <laughs> Last February, Dr. Kalabakidis mentioned that one of the risks of the 2020 February forecast was the, quote, prolonged and widespread virus outbreak, end quote. Before COVID-19, Minnesota's economy was in good shape, and we had a projected surplus of more than $1.5 billion for this biennium with low unemployment. By May, MMB took unprecedented action and released an interim budget projection to give policymakers updated budget information as they planned for the end of the legislative session. Due to volatile economic conditions, we projected a $2.4 billion deficit for the current biennium, which was nearly $4 billion change from the February forecast. Today, I have some good news. Minnesota's forecast has significantly improved even as COVID-19 impacts remain. Due to improved economic conditions, the projected deficit anticipated last May has been eliminated. And we now project a $641 million surplus for the current fiscal period. I wanna be clear that this does not use any of the budget reserve. For the next two year budget, we still project a shortfall of $1.3 billion, which while a challenge, is still an improvement from the $5 billion projected as a shortfall in May. Behind this rosier picture, we still have revenue issues compared to where we started last February. And today's forecast only adds back about half the revenue taken in May. The other material difference in today's forecast is a reduction in spending. And Budget Director Raytan will touch on this in her presentation. We know that the pandemic has affected all Minnesotans, bringing with it a run of discouraging events and news, especially for lower wage workers where the economic impact has been concentrated. We still have challenges ahead, but this budget and revenue forecast brings a bit of good news to the state. I'm gonna walk through a couple of slides here, giving you the top line numbers as to the state uh, finances, and then we're gonna walk through the economy and revenue numbers, as well as expenditure changes that really lead to these conclusions. This first slide shows you the information for the current biennium, which ends in June, 2021. As mentioned earlier, you'll see that our estimated bottom line significantly improves with a swing of nearly $3 billion since May. This is a result of $1.9 billion in additional projected revenue and $1.1 billion less in projected spending. This change is unusually large for a forecast this close to the end of the biennium. It's also important. With only seven months left in the fiscal year, the state has fewer and fewer options to balance the budget. Unlike the federal government, there's not borrowing to deficit finance. So based on these estimates, this biennium's budget can be balanced even without using any rainy day funds. The next slide shows that this improvement isn't temporary. We see similar improvement in the next budget period. The first column again shows the estimate for the current period with a projected $641 million surplus. The second column shows planning estimates for fiscal years 22 and 23. These estimates provide the foundation for Governor Walz and the legislature from which to build their budget proposals. In our estimates, we anticipate spending to exceed revenues by $1.3 billion. This means that while the budget is improved, we still see a $1.3 billion shortfall in the forecast for the next biennium. Finally, uh, there is a $491 million on this chart anticipating your questions. This is not a forecast change. That change in reserves is a transfer from the budget reserve to the general fund that's a result of the 2019 end of session budget negotiations. So that's the top line picture. Uh, but now let's get into uh, the rest of the story. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kala Bakitas who will describe changes in our economic outlook. Thank you, Commissioner Showalter. I'm Laura Kalambakidis, Minnesota State Economist. So I'm gonna start with a high level overview of the revenue forecast change, which I don't usually do, and then jump into the uh, economic outlook. 
So the extraordinary volatility and uncertainty in the economy since the beginning of the global COVID-19 pandemic has led to changes in our economic and revenue forecasts. In this chart, the height of the bars shows each of the three revenue forecasts for the current biennium, fiscal years 20 and 21, that we've made this year. In May, we released, as you know, our interim budget projection as the pandemic was taking hold, as economic activity was being restricted to slow the disease spread, and the economy was contracting after a record long 10-year expansion. At that point, U.S. real GDP was expected to decline 5.4% this year. Record numbers of Minnesotans were filing unemployment claims, and the state unemployment rate was spiking at two percentage points above the peak in the previous recession. As shown in the second bar in this chart, in that May projection, we reduced the revenue forecast for the current biennium by $3.7 billion. Economic conditions have improved since May as some restrictions on activity have been lifted and federal payments have supported businesses, consumers, and governments. Consequently, we're now adding back $1.9 billion to the forecast, or about half of what we took out in May. This is illustrated with the third bar in the chart. I'll now turn to describing the economic outlook that underlies our revenue forecast. In this chart, the height of the bars shows annual U.S. real GDP growth. The dark bars show the history and, and the November forecast by IHS, Minnesota's consulting firm. The gray bars show IHS's April forecast. That's the one that informed our May interim budget projection. In the history, you can see the economic contraction or the decline in GDP that occurred during the last recession, when GDP fell 0.1% in 2008 and 2.5% in 2009. And then that was followed by 10 years of growth. Now, if you focus on the right-hand side of the chart, you can see the forecast change. IHS now expects real GDP to decline 3.6% this year compared to the 5.4% decline they expected in May. This improvement is due to higher consumer spending and business investment so far this year than had been forecast in the spring. Annual growth is expected to return in 2021 at a rate of 3.1% and continue through the remainder of our forecast period. Both of the forecasts show a decline followed by a large acceleration. The magnitude of the acceleration in 21 is smaller in the November forecast because the smaller decline in 20 means you don't need as high a percentage increase to get back to where you were. Real GDP is forecast to grow an average of 2.7% annually through 25. IHS expects real GDP to regain its pre-pandemic peak in early 22 and the economy to return to full employment in 24. The economic recovery is expected to be uneven with GDP associated with production of goods having already reached its pre-pandemic level. And the service sector is not expected to fully recover until a significant portion of the population is vaccinated against COVID-19. The U.S. outlook remains volatile and uncertain and depends critically on the path of the pandemic. In this forecast, IHS assumes that the rate of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths remain elevated until a COVID-19 vaccine is widely available, which they assume will be in the middle of next year. At that time, they expect the economy to transition from recovery to expansion, particularly in the sectors that are hardest hit by social distancing and safety concerns, such as consumer spending on entertainment and travel. In this outlook, IHS also assumes no further federal fiscal stimulus beyond measures already enacted. Mm -hmm. So any additional federal, federal support, whether it's at, by the end of this year or in the first quarter of next year, or a more rapid vaccination timeline, would both cause the economy to grow faster than shown in the November outlook. Now let's move to Minnesota. In this chart, the line shows the last 11 years of Minnesota total employment. During the economic expansion, Minnesota experienced steady employment growth, adding 337,000 jobs. In February, employment had reached about 3 million. Then the pandemic hit, restrictions were put in place, and Minnesota lost 388,000 jobs in March and April. As some restrictions were lifted, the state regained just over half that number of jobs through October, leaving employment 184,000 below the February level. Note that at the end of the employment curve, at the end of that line, the curve is beginning to bend or become flatter. That means that the pace of job growth in the state is slowing. 
we've already reaped the easiest job gains, further gains will be harder to achieve. During the most recent months of job growth, Minnesota's unemployment rate has fallen from the May peak of 9.9% to 4.6%, well below the US rate and ninth lowest among states. However, the last two months of employment decline have occurred because of Minnesota, I'm sorry, the last two months of unemployment decline have occurred because of Minnesotans leaving the labor force rather than from unemployed workers finding jobs. Since February, 107,000 Minnesotans have left the labor force. In the next chart, we show the annual growth rate in total Minnesota wage and salary income. So that's the sum of all the payrolls of all the employers in the state, and the height of the bars show the growth rate in that, that variable. The dark bars show the history, and the stripe bars show our new forecast. Again, you can see the decline in total wage income that occurred in the previous recession, 4.8%. We are now forecasting a decline of 1.4% this year and moderate growth averaging 4.8% annually thereafter. That 1.4% decline is a significant improvement from the wage contraction or the wage decline that we expected in our May projection. So how can we have a relatively small decline in wage income this year when our unemployment rate peaked at such a high level? The reason is that unemployment in this economic downturn has disproportionately impacted low wage workers. We know that a large share of unemployment insurance benefit claimants in Minnesota were from lower wage occupations. And there's evidence from US data that the duration of unemployment is longer for low wage workers than for higher wage workers. This has led us to forecast a smaller decline in Minnesota total wage income than we projected in May. And that improvement has increased our income and sales tax forecasts. Another unexpected phenomenon shown in the next chart in this downturn has been a shift in consumer spending patterns. First, consumer spending in general this year has been higher than forecast. That's one of the reasons underlying IHS's improved US forecast. Second, consumers have shifted away from spending on some kinds of services, on the things that have, are affected by social distance. Uh, instead, they're purchasing taxable goods. This chart shows the level of US consumer spending on durable goods. This includes furniture and electronics, for example. The dark dashed line shows the February forecast and the light dashed line shows the April forecast and the solid dark line shows the November forecast. You can see from that dark line that consumer spending on these goods, which are generally taxable in Minnesota, has not only outperformed expectations from April and didn't fall in the spring, but instead has increased and exceeded the February forecast. This shift has supported higher than expected sales tax revenue this year and led us to increase our sales tax forecast. Turning to the new revenue forecast, the first two columns of this table show the current forecast and the forecast change for the current biennium, and the next two columns show the same for the next biennium. The revenue forecast for fiscal year 21, the current fiscal year, reflects the four week pause on in-person dining, sports and fitness establishments that Governor Walls enacted beginning November 20th and continuing through December. So we did make adjustments to the revenue forecast for that. Total general fund revenues for the current biennium, as, you, as you've heard a couple of times now, are now forecast to be $1.9 billion more than the May projection. The estimates for all major tax types have been increased. It's important to note that at the beginning of this forecast period, so far in fiscal year 21, actual revenue collections are $805 million higher than we projected in May, reflecting the improved economic forecast that I've been talking about. Individual income tax receipts are now forecast to be $500 million more than the May projection. That increase is primarily due to the projected improvement in the wage income forecast I showed earlier. Sales tax revenue is now forecast to be $808 million more than the prior projection. And that forecast is consistent with the shift in consumer spending I mentioned, and is also due to higher collections, uh, sales tax collections so far in this fiscal year. And the corporate tax story is similar. Corporate tax is projected to generate $390 million more than the prior forecast, based on a higher forecast for corporate profits and higher collections so far this fiscal year. And the story for the next biennium is similar. Because we have a higher base of projection, because the, the current biennium um, forecast is higher, uh, that, uh, in, that increased as well as um, we have faster forecast growth in income, consumer spending, and profits. Let me finish by reiterating some of the many risks to this forecast. I've mentioned that the economic forecast depends critically on the path of the pandemic, 
timing of a vaccine, and the pace of lifting rest restrictions on economic activity. All of those uncertainties amplify economic risks, including when and whether businesses and consumers will feel safe resuming normal activities, and whether businesses that have been affected by social distancing restrictions will make it through the next year. In addition, new federal fiscal support would improve the economic outlook relative to what we are assuming here. And finally, with 30 months remaining until the end of the next biennium, even small changes in assumed growth, ra growth rates in important revenue sources can have big changes in the outlook for this biennium in the next. I'll now turn it over to State Budget Director Britta Rayton. Good morning, my name is Britta Rayton, State Budget Director at MMB. With this next slide, we're turning to the expenditure side of the forecast. And this slide shows the change in spending projections from previous projections for the current biennium 20 and 21 and the next biennium 22 and 23. Overall projected spending in the current biennium is down by 1.058 billion relative to our prior estimates. The change is smaller in 22, 23 with a $409 million reduction in spending estimates relative to our previous projections. As you can see on the chart, E12 education spending estimates are down 118 million in the current biennium when compared to our May projection. The biggest driver of this change is reduced student counts relative to our prior estimates. We were already seeing lower student counts relative to our previous projections in FY20, but there is an even greater decline from previous estimates in FY21, the current school year, as families have made different choices given the pandemic, possibly opting to delay kindergarten enrollment, opt for private school enrollment, or to homeschool their students. In total, the student count in this forecast decreased by 12,600 students relative to our prior projection for the current school year. It's important to note that this 12,600 student decline in projections is on a base of 875,000 students. So in total, it's not a very large percentage, but it does equate to significant dollar savings in the forecast. MDE projects year over year increases in pupil counts going forward. However, our, our projections still remain below previous projection, projections in 22 and 23, and there's also savings in that biennium as well. This slide also shows decreases relative to the prior forecast in health and human services spending. The HHS expenditure forecast is down 919 million in 20 and 21 and 250 million in 22, 23 relative to our previous estimates. There are three significant components of change in the health and human, human services forecast. The first significant component is that we are assuming that the state and federal COVID emergency declarations will continue through the first two quarters of calendar year 21 or until June 30, 2021. Assuming an extension of the federal public health emergency means the state will continue to receive increased federal support for the medical assistance program. The federal match is increased by 6.2 percentage points during the emergency period. And this increase lowers the state share of medical assistance by 310 million in the first two quarters of calendar year 21. Our previous projection, it's important to note, has already recognized this increased match for the duration of calendar year 2020. One component of receiving the additional uh, federal medical assistance match is that the state must, must maintain continuous coverage requirements for individuals on medical assistance. Another significant component of the forecast change is a revision to the estimate for that requirement. We've revised that down by 175 million compared to our previous estimates for calendar year 2020. In May, when we first estimated the cost of the continuous coverage requirement, at that time, there was limited data or experience to inform how enrollment in medical assistance would be affected by the federal requirement. At that time, we assumed all individuals on medical assistance at the start of the pandemic would remain on the program for the duration of the federal public health emergency. We now have six months of data and experience during the pandemic, and we understand that enrollment for MA basic care was 5.5% lower than previously anticipated. So there are people exiting the medical assistance program for allowable reasons, and we updated our estimates accordingly. 
And the third significant component of change is lower utilization of services during the COVID pandemic. And these, these updates were not incorporated in our May budget projection. This change is estimated to be a reduction of spending of 293 million compared to our previous estimates. And 217 million of that reduction is in medical assistance, particularly in our fee for service program, which is due to individuals deferring or forgoing medical services during the pandemic. This forecast does assume a slow return to pre-COVID utilization levels towards the end of the next biennium. Moving on to the next slide, we return to a view of the total revenues and expenditures in the general fund. And this slide shows the upcoming 2023 biennium as well as provides a look at the planning estimates for 24 and 25. This slide is showing the structural balance in the next two biennia, which means we are just comparing revenues to expenditures in each biennium without including carry forward amounts or changes in reserve levels. So you can see that we do not have structural balance in either biennia, meaning that our forecast spending in each biennium exceeds the forecast revenues. The structural gap in 22-23 totals 1.6 billion. This number is higher than the shortfall we cited earlier, and that's because the $1.6 billion number does not account for the use of the $491 million in the budget reserve that is assumed in law in 22 and 23. There is also an ongoing structural shortfall in 24 and 25 of $552 million. The size of that structural gap, though, does narrow from 22, 23 into 24 and 25. This is because the revenue estimates are growing faster than the expenditure estimates. And you can see that displayed in the biennial growth section of the chart on the right hand side. And finally, we do include an estimation of inflation on this slide for the next two biennia. This is to give a sense of the cost pressures that exist into the next two biennium and into the planning years. Inflation is generally not included in the expenditure estimates in the forecast, except in a limited number of programs where there's an inflation component in the formula or where the formula is based on actual costs. So some examples would include property tax refunds or special education program and a portion of our health care as well as debt service. The $1.3 billion in 2223 and the $2.9 billion in 24-25 shown on the slide is an estimate of inflation applied only to those expenditures where inflation is not already included in a forecast program. And with that, I will pass it back to Commissioner Showalter. Thank you, Britta. Um, before we leave this slide, uh, I just want to emphasize again uh, the impact of for future estimates. Uh, so while we've been talking about a budget challenge uh, in the upcoming biennium and the future biennium, those figures do not include uh, roughly $4.2 billion in the impact of inflation. You've heard me talk about it before, and I think it's just an important point because even with this improved outlook, we still have difficult decisions ahead to ensure long-term fiscal stability. So uh, let's go to the conclusion. Um, we're weathering a difficult and volatile time. Just today, uh, news was released that an additional 22 Minnesotans died from COVID-19, bringing the total to 3,615. Uh, there were 3,570 positive cases, bringing that total to 322,000. Yet amidst that incredibly difficult news is some good news, which is Minnesota's managed our state budget well. We've made smart decisions preparing for an economic downturn and ensuring that our tax policy is able to withstand the unexpected. Our rainy day fund is still at the highest level in our state's history. And if our forecast holds, we'll still be able to use it as a buffer for projected shortfall in the next biennium or to provide more services to Minnesotans affected by both health and economic crises caused by COVID-19. Good management of the state has provided time to better understand the pandemic time to sort through the economic impacts and an opportunity to take more thoughtful action. We still have much to learn in the coming months, but smart long-term thinking has put us in a better position despite pandemic challenges. So uh, before we end this presentation, I just wanna thank the dedicated team at MMB who have worked on this forecast, even while balancing countless other tasks required from reporting, from pandemic response, 
and all the other challenges of day-to-day -day life. We all owe you our thanks. Uh, with that, Ellen, uh, that ends our presentation, um, and I, we are all available for questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want just a, a reminder on how we'll handle questions here. Um, please use the raise hand function at the top of your screen um, and remain muted until, um, until we call your name. Um, with your hand raised, I should be able to get you um, unmuted. Um, I will announce your name, and then we'll let you um, ask that question. Um, I will try to make sure people have um, get get a question each before any there's any sort of second ones. But um, and I, I will go in order as I see them. Um, so uh, this is a this is we I will I will do my best. Um, my first question um, we have is Mary Lahammer from from TPT. Hi, my question is about Commissioner the volatility in this forecast obviously this pandemic is unprecedented does there have to be monthly forecasts how should the legislature be advised besides the february forecast should we have march april may as you go forward oh goodness no i i think uh, the lesson of this is that continued uh, looking at new information is important but that the two forecasts a year is a really useful construct where we have new information. It's difficult to make mid-year estimates because of all of the information and all of the thinking that goes into a forecast. This was a great opportunity to sort of pull together all that information and not uh, and, and to set the course. We manage volatility with reserves with constant surveillance of information of what's going on in the economy and in spending, and then we make actions. And then we'll bring it all back together again in the next forecast. So I don't think this is a call for constant forecasts. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a, a indication that our estimates and our process has actually been working quite well. Your next question from Brian Bax at NPR. Hey, I have a couple of questions for uh, Budget Director Rattan, uh, just to clear a couple things up. Can you quantify the number of students lost to the public school system that uh, represents the $119 million? And is there an expectation that once the threat of the virus is cleared, that some or many of those students will flow back to the public school system? And then the other question relates to the, the Medicare comments you made, or the Medicaid comments. Does the state and the federal emergency have to remain intact in order for that money to keep flowing? Um, I will start with the education question. And so uh, we were seeing already in our underlying forecast before we kind of layered on the impact of the COVID pandemic uh, for this current year, we were seeing a decline um, in pupils relative to our previous forecast. To be clear, we still have a, had an upward trajectory in pupils, but a, a decline relative to the previous forecast. So about 4,000 pupil unit change was already baked into our November estimate before we layered on the impact of the COVID pandemic and, and families making different choices. So about 8,334 um, additional pupils um, were, were added into that reduction, bringing us to a, a total reduction in the current year from previous forecasts of 12,676 pupils. Um, that really pretty closely tracks with the, the savings in the education area. It's both in general education and there's a total student um, component of the special ed formula as well. So it, it shows up in both general education and special education. We are anticipating pupils to return, um, but but not all in the next year. Um, there is a, uh, a stepped up uh, assumption about return in, out into the, the coming years. Um, to your question about medical assistance, um, we are assuming both the state and federal um, emergency declaration continue until June. There are um, provisions that we are required to, to uh, keep in effect in terms of uh, continuous coverage, as I mentioned, um, that rely on the on the state 
emergency orders in order to implement. So in order to generate the increased federal match, uh, we need to continue the, the statewide emergency um, to continue that continuous coverage requirement to generate the federal match. But it, but it's mandatory that that uh, executive power remain in place or could it be done legislatively? Oh, it could be done in other ways, yes. But the, our assumption is that both in this forecast that both are continuing in order to generate that match. Thank you. Our next question is from Dave Oreck with the Pioneer Press. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, could you explain if there is any impact in federal CARES dollars and other federal stimulus to the state accounts that play into all this? I'll start, but Britta, uh, I'll turn it to you for uh, more. The, the, the simple answer is federal funds aren't part of the general fund. So these are general tax revenues like the sales tax, the income tax. And while there, it is certainly part of the economic story about how Minnesotans were able to get help from quick reaction by state leaders as well as federal leaders this spring, that money does not show up in the numbers that we've been talking about. And Britta, you want to just talk about some of the documents that will be available in a couple of days? Certainly. Um, we do have um, the, the CARES money will show up in our accounting of our federal fund, as well as we have a, a separate fund established for the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, so as we um, release our consolidated fund statement that is beyond just the general fund, um, there will be documents that show um, that federal revenue coming into the state and that spending. But that's not in the general fund. Okay, thank you. And and one other question, and this is uh, sort of a touchy one, but I just I, I want to ask it anyways. Is there any impact economically that you guys see in the number of deaths that we've had from the pandemic? Uh, did people have an economic impact? And I, I don't know if that's anything baked in, if the numbers are high enough or not. Uh, that's a different question. I haven't, Laura, do you have any sense of that? Uh, no, I, I, we, we make, we make a projection of total employment and total wage growth. And we take into consideration population forecasts when we do that. Uh, and so I think it's unlikely at this point that, uh, deaths from COVID have been incorporated into those population forecasts. Thank you all. We have time for a couple more questions here before noon. Our next question, um, and again, I'm going in order that I saw your hand raised. So our next question is the O'Keefe with Fox 9. Hey, everybody. Uh, am I unmuted now? We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, one of you mentioned that it might have been Dr. Kalambakitis that um, the impact of the most recent four-week shutdown on gyms, bars, restaurants, movie theaters, etc., had been factored into this latest forecast. Um, how, by how much? Uh, what's the impact of that? And has it been measured if if uh, that will be uh, extended? Uh, yeah, yeah. When we constructed the revenue forecast, we knew that there was going to be this four week pause, this temporary pause. And so we've incorporated that into our revenue forecast, but not in a way that I can isolate the impact and give you a dollar value. Uh, and not and we have not estimated the impact of an extension of this. We did we do we can we construct a current law forecast and the current law incorporated this one um, this one pause. Uh, and then just uh, quickly, Commissioner Showalter, you might uh, want to take this one, but there will be skeptics out there, of course, uh, because of the pretty dramatic swings this year already. Uh, understanding, of course, that you all have six months of information to go off of now, but uh, can, can you just address that skepticism that may be out there uh, that, uh, you know, who is to believe these latest numbers, essentially? Of course. I, this year uh, has brought things that nobody anticipated. 
that when we started 2020, nobody would be thinking that the economic, the health, the social issues that we're all grappling with would all happen in one year. I would never have predicted I would be doing a forecast in my basement. Uh, so all of these things are unanticipated. What we can do is learn. We can keep on observing. We can keep on finding more information and make smart judgments from them. And that's exactly what's happening. We took information in May, incomplete as it was, but we took what information we had and made estimates and, and looked forward and tried to judge from that. Now that we're uh, into early December, we're doing the same thing. We've got more information. We can make better estimates. We can make better judgments. We're telling you we don't know everything. We don't know the future, but we can use the information that we've gleaned from the last six months to make a lot better under estimates and a lot better understanding of how people will react to the pandemic. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to get through a couple last questions here before noon. Our next um, question is from Patricia Lopez with the Star Tribune. I. You are um, unmuted. Thanks for taking my question. Um, Commissioner, I wanted to ask in the whole pantheon of different varieties of assistance that can be given, what types of state and federal aid would best foster economic growth in your opinion and how most effectively to target it? Good question. Um, you know, I, I, as you know, uh, Pat, you know, a, in a, a forecast, you try not to answer too many budget questions. Um, so. But I, I think one of the things that was really stands out from the past was quick action. That when the state legislature took quick action, it, it allowed businesses to have some understanding of certainty of what was available. It had, it, when federal action was taken, uh, the business loans and the UI benefits were extended and people were able to manage less uncertainty. I think that's kind of the, the, the key here. When we're dealing with really unprecedented situations. It's part of government's responsibility to try to help everyone, uh, keep it into context and uh, help us all do our best. And and have you um, been able to get any idea about the optimal amount here? No, I, I haven't. And I think it, as this forecast suggests, uh, you know, it all depends on how you're impacted. You know, clearly the impacts of this recession and the impacts of COVID-19 are really concentrated. And that some sectors and particularly some employees and some families are particularly hard hit. And I think that's a, a, an important and sobering fact of uh, even within this good financial news. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question is from Esme Murphy with WCCO. Esme, you are muted. Esme, I think you're still muted. All right, let's move on to the next one. We can come back to um, to that. Uh, uh, one additional question from Tom Hauser. And Tom, you are also muted. I'm still not hearing him. No. Nope. Um, I changed one setting that should be helpful here. Um, Tom Hauser, are you with us? We'll go back to him too. We'll do just a couple more here. I'm sorry for the delay, everyone. Um, I do know can, we have. Can you a, hear me now? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm not sure what's going on with the mutes, but I I thought it was unmuted. I, I just wanted to follow up on Theo's question about this uh, four week pause. I, I was unclear on whether uh, you have factored in the possibility of that pause in bar, restaurant, and health club closings, et cetera and maybe even an extension of that uh, for another month or however long? Uh, we have we have accounted for 
the pause that is currently in place, the, the four week pause that started on November 20th, and we have not extended any, we haven't assumed any extension of that. If, if there was such a pause and let's say it was even expanded to include other businesses, how big of an impact could that have? You know, it actually will depend on why it gets extended. So if the path of the pandemic requires changes in a way that requires more uh, economic restrictions than what we already have in the forecast, then that will affect that will affect the forecast. So it it depends on why it happens. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience, Tom. Too. Um, let's go back to Esme Murphy, who is now unmuted. Oh, I see the icon. It should be good to go. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, this question is met with all due respect. Um, I'm just thinking of the person who is sitting out there, perhaps hearing this, who has been struggling with their own budget, not knowing where it's going, you know, where where it's been, and probably wondering how could you folks get this so wrong? And also how, at a time when trust is so important in government, can they really trust what you're doing with, with you know, projections of billions of dollars that is ultimately their money? Fair question. And uh, I think the important thing here is we're all dealing with really unprecedented situations. I don't think there were many people in Minnesota, whether economists or politicians or people on the street who would have expected sales taxes to actually go up when we're in the midst of a significant recession. I think also just, you know, you know looking at the impact that we saw from this recession this spring and comparing it personally to what we were seeing 10 years ago in the Great Recession, you would have expected much more significant impact on the state budget and on consumer spending and on incomes than we're seeing right now. So uh, this is unprecedented, this is unusual, and I think the best thing we can do is continue to learn and understand that this pandemic is not your average economic recession. It is very unique. Um, and very challenging. Thank and you, why Commissioner. Should trust, why should people trust these these additional forecasts that there's going to be a, a billion dollar shortfall in 2022, 2022, 2023? Um, I think the question, I don't know, Dr. Kalambakitis, if you have a, a additional, I think the key here, Esme, is quite simply, that we are all understanding the impact of COVID-19 better every day, every month. That this is not something that the economy has experienced for a long, long time, in none of our lifetimes. As a result, the best thing we can do um, is continue to monitor, to learn, and try to ask questions about what's happening and how we can react better. And um, you. I, if you don't mind, I'd like to add a, a point or two here, and that is that um, you know this slide that I showed with the forecast change in the revenues over the course of this year, uh, those changes, the volatility in the revenue forecast is a direct result of volatility in the economic forecast and the and in the economy itself. If we hadn't done the May projection and we were just comparing today to February, we'd be taking money out of the forecast. And people would be saying, of course, there was a pandemic and there's been an economic downturn, therefore money's coming out of the forecast. But we, it was important in the spring to provide the best information we had uh, and construct a forecast so that policymakers could, could start making decisions. And we've learned a lot between May and now, and we will learn more between now and the February forecast. And so the fact that we are we will adjust it again in February will help people see uh, see how uh, how how this work how this work is done and to follow that path. And I would also add that um, we have we constructed the May forecast and this one and the February forecast and the next February report forecast using the same techniques and the same models and the same um, kinds of information as our previous forecasts. And so the process, people can pr trust the process and trust that 
uh, we are producing the best forecasts we can given the information that we have and given the very rapidly changing landscape we find ourselves in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question, um, Ricardo Lopez with the Minnesota Reformer. Um, thank you for following up when your hand wouldn't raise. So <laughs> you are, uh, we're, we're ready for you now. Great. Um, I just wanted to see, get sort of a more of a description or, or quantification of how exactly the Federal CARES Act money helped, uh, you know, factor into this uh, current budget surplus. And, um, you know, I know it doesn't account for any future federal stimulus, but I wanted to hear maybe a, a, some type of a breakdown or explanation as to how significant that Federal CARES Act money was in, in helping shore up the state's budget. I can start if you if you would like, um, Jim and Laura, and then Laura, maybe you can talk about the economic impacts of the of the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act dollars that actually came to the state of Minnesota, um, both through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which was a, a significant pot of nearly two billion dollars that came to the state of Minnesota, as well as the programmatic specific dollars um, that came to Minnesota for a, a whole host of federal programs where they increased. Uh, spending in those federal programs, all of that money comes in through our federal funds. And so they're not reflected in our general fund. And in fact, uh, the CARES Act was, was very clear that we couldn't use those federal dollars to fill behind lost state revenues. So we could not supplant spending in our general fund or, or reimburse our general fund um, with those dollars. So the, what you're seeing here um, for the general fund does not include any CARES Act dollars coming into the general fund and, and propping up state revenues. Um, I, I think Dr. Kolomakitas would say the CARES Act was very helpful in terms of uh, the economic supports that it gave. And so maybe Dr. Kolomakitas, you wanna to speak to that. Sure, the uh, federal fiscal stimulus checks, the additional um, pandemic unemployment support, the PPP uh, forgivable loans, all of those things contributed, sort of kept the economy afloat through the summer and fall and contributed to the um, unexpectedly um, robust consumer spending uh, that we saw, that we've seen, the US forecast has seen and that Minnesota has seen. Uh, and the unemployment insurance benefits are taxable in Minnesota. And so uh, that contributed to our income taxes. But generally what it meant was that households that needed money at the time because they lost jobs had some and they were able to continue to spend and continue to pay rent. Not, not enough to cover, uh, you know, cover everyone's um, household budget, but uh, it was a big help. So is it fair to characterize it then as a significant and direct um impact on the state's budget picture? I mean, given, you know, as, as you pointed out, it helped keep the economy afloat. Um, and I think, you know, may, I don't know how much in the spring, uh, sort of, the, you know, the state budget office had forecasted consumer spending to be as strong as it was, particularly on things like durable goods. But um, so, so was it a significant indirect impact on, on the state's fiscal picture? Are you saying a significant indirect impact? Yes. Yes, I would say so, that, um, Federal fiscal support supported in household disposable income during the course of the summer and fall, uh, helped businesses keep people employed, and in turn, that supported state tax revenues. And would you expect that to have a significant impact if there's another round of federal stimulus? Yes. The, um, the macro for forecaster that we use, IHS, as I said in my um, comments, does not assume an additional federal fiscal stimulus. Uh, but if one is enacted and is available in the first quarter of next year, they forecast that that will increase uh, U.S. real GDP growth next year, 21, um, by on the order of one and a half percentage points. And while you, you know, I don't have a direct crosswalk between GDP and Minnesota revenues, um, Minnesota's economy is tied to the U.S. economy. So if the U.S. economy is doing better, Minnesota's economy uh, will do better as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ricardo. We have two questions left I want to make sure we get to. Um, I have a question from Bill Werner with MNN um, over the phone. So bear with us as we get this unmuted. I'm hopeful we can get it to work. Bill, if you're ready, please unmute as you are able and ask your question. All right, we'll come back to Bill. Um, oh, there we go. Bill, I think we're ready for you. Bill Werner, we're ready for your question. Okay, we'll come back to Bill. Um, our second to last question is uh, from Lori Sturdivant at the Star Tribune. Everybody, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, question for Commissioner Showalter. Commissioner, I know you were an architect of the state's uh, law that allows the reserve to grow somewhat automatically with November forecasts. Did this surplus forca uh, forecast today trigger another flow of dollars into the reserve fund? And, and then more generally, what policy advice would you give to lawmakers now for the prudent use of the rainy day fund that exists? Uh, thanks, Lori. Uh, you know, you're right. Uh, the, the the reserve is really important, and it's been an important part of the state's infrastructure for a while because it helps give people time to understand the situation. It helps gives us a chance to have uh, reactions and, and opportunities to take action when other states can't, because they're taking they're already trying to figure out how to pay the bills. Um, this forecast doesn't change the reserve picture doesn't automatically uh, put more money in. We're already at the ceiling. But I, you know, I think the key long-term thing is that we constantly look at using it judiciously in downtimes and making sure we continue to invest in it in, in better times, simply because you don't know when you need it. And, and, and this reserve certainly has given us a lot more flexibility as a state in the last 12 months because when we didn't know how COVID-19 was going to impact the state, the legislature and the governor both had time to assess what was happening rather than take abrupt action in May. And that's the kind of advantage that uh, the reserve policy has given us. And that has real impact for Minnesotans. So prudently, what should be the use of that fund, especially for the current biennium by the legislature and, and the governor in the next few months? You know, I think, as usual, Laurie, I would uh, caution, concern, especially since we have a balance in the uh, current biennium, uh, because we still have a lot of really unclear and uncertain uh, issues that will be worked out, whether it's the path of the pandemic, the impact on economic activity, whether or not the federal government is going to help states as we try to continue fighting the pandemic or get roll out a vaccine business reaction and uh, sustainability. There are a lot of very big variables out there. And hopefully we'll have a reserve uh, to help us manage those things uh, as we come up to them. Thank you, Commissioner. And thanks, Lori. Um, I will. I wanna give one more chance to see if we can get Bill Werner to get his question through from the phone. Bill, if you, if you are ready, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, can you hear me all right? I think I'm unmuted. We can hear you. Folks, Go hear ahead. Okay, very good. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I want to focus in on the unemployment situation because I know Minnesota has done quite a bit better than the nation uh, in terms of unemployment recovering from this. But one thing that that's, sticks out in, in the description here, it says, the last two months of unemployment decline have occurred because of Minnesotans leaving the labor force rather than from unemployed workers finding jobs. Um, what's the mechanism that's going on here? Are people giving up? Are they just deciding, oh, I'm going to retire now? Or do you folks have any feel for, for what, uh, what is causing that? And, and could that shift in the sense that people change their minds and then we see a big spike in, in the unemployment rate as measured, I don't know, you know, three, four months down the road? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The, we don't know why people have left the labor force. We don't, um, you know, we don't ask them. Uh, you know, you can speculate that one of the one of the points you made was maybe people have retired. Um, maybe it's a temporary thing where um, you know people are needed at at home 
for now through the through the pandemic. So we don't actually know why. Uh, we just we we make that point so that people don't think don't you know get a sense of complacency about that the low the low unemployment rate. That there's another part of that story. There are other parts of that story than just that we have a 4.6% unemployment rate. Um, it could be temporary, and that is an interesting point. That going forward, and this we learned this through, you know, through the previous economic expansion. That going forward, looking at the the headline unemployment rate, you do want to drill down and figure out why did the unemployment rate change? Did it change because people entered the workforce and didn't immediately find jobs? Um, did it go up because of that? Did it go down because? people who were working decided they're no longer going to be in the labor force. So um, that could happen. And I would uh, encourage everyone to continue to ask those questions as unemployment data, you know, probably bounces around um, in the next months. Thanks very much. Thank you all for um, letting us go a little bit over here. I do at this point want to hand it off to Teddy Chan with the, with Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's office. Um, Teddy, are you, you are yeah. unmuted, so go ahead. Thanks, Ellen. And thank everybody for joining today. Uh, with that, Governor Walls, I'm gonna invite you to come on here. Um, the governor just arrived and is available. He's gonna give brief remarks and then we'll stick around for some question and answer here. Well, thank you, Teddy. Good afternoon to everyone. And, and thank you for joining us via Teams. I know this is uh, quite different like much of 2020, but we wanted to make sure that everybody was on and we could have this uh, important discussion with all of you. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the economic team, these uh, incredible servant leaders, public servants, Commissioner Showalter, who uh, came back in and uh, literally took the baton from uh, former Commissioner Franz um, at a time of, uh, as you're hearing and all are living, uh, great economic uncertainty. I am I am grateful for him and his team. And um, I would have to believe that Commissioner Franz is probably listening to us. Um, and so I would like to thank him for that work. Uh, as always to our state economist, Dr. Klambakidis, um, always gives us great in-depth on the macroeconomics. I think the scholarship that goes into this is uh, incredible. I spend a lot of time with her to understand this. I do think it should be noted though, um, bringing the scholarship on a macroeconomic level, but understanding the microeconomics of how this impacts individual families, food on their table and their rent is uh, a real trait that uh, that doctor brings to this. I'm, I'm grateful for that, Dr. Kamakitis. And Budget Director Rayton, your team has been working uh, nonstop as you always do. Uh, you take the inputs and uh, start to get that data so that we can, again, look at it from a numbers perspective, but how it impacts families. So uh, incredibly grateful. And uh, this is a team that we came into this um, with AAA bond rating, with one of the strongest fiscal positions of any state in the nation the vision of uh, former Governor Dayton and the legislature to build a rainy day fund, um, to make sure that our fiscal health of the state was solid, uh, went a long ways to making sure that when we needed to provide help, we were able to do so. When we needed to provide testing around a novel coronavirus, we were able to stand that up from scratch in partnering with um, our public institutions, our private sector partners. Uh, and I will have to say, someone told me this morning that they had forgotten that you can get good news in 2020. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. I, th I think we should take that for what it is. Um, I'd also like to make note that the reason that this is good, because of the resiliency of Minnesotans. This is the resiliency of Minnesotans in an unprecedented public health crisis to figure out how to work in a different way, to figure out how to get their kids childcare, to care about their neighbors enough to invest and spend back in their local community to make sure that those businesses, no matter how tenuous the situation were, knew that they were getting support from their neighbors and to those businesses who were asked to do things again that at least in a hundred years, no one has been asked. We've asked Americans to sacrifice. We've asked them to ration. We've asked different things, but on a scale, a national and global scale and, and the businesses that were most impacted by this small family owned businesses, hospitality businesses did it because what they understood was the health of Minnesotans is directly tied to the health of the economy. So I want to just give a thank you for that. This was never a choice and never should be a choice between the health 
public health and the health of Minnesotans and a healthy economy. This false dichotomy that was put out that you, you had to pick one over the other is simply not correct, that there is a way that we can do this, both from a moral perspective of protecting Minnesotans, but also the long-term health of what our economy looks like and what that provides back to us. So um, I want to note reasons to be optimistic, reasons to look. Again, some of you heard me say this, especially when it comes to the rainy day fund. Uh, contrary to, uh, uh, to social media, uh, I have a pretty proven track record of being fairly fiscally conservative. And if you recall, it was last January and February with the calls that we should spend down the reserves. It was too big and we should give back that money in checks rather than understanding that that provides the resiliency in the economy that builds the capacity for everyone to thrive in this economy. But that brings me to the next point. Um, COVID has not hit everyone in this economy equally. Some businesses have been able to go on with changes and with changes to routine, but been able to function fairly normally as it was before. Those who were in a position and a privilege to be able to work from home and have the security of that were able to continue on in a very similar manner. But let's be very clear about this when you look at these numbers. The impact has been disproportionately on wage earners, especially those on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, communities of color, native communities, all of those, once again, the most fragile communities, the ones that tend to be precursors of what's going on, they have been hurt and those small businesses, those small businesses that are the vitality in both large and small communities all across Minnesota. So what I would take away from this is, again, a thank you for the resiliency, the willingness to work to protect health, as well as understanding that protects the long-term value of the economy, but also a willingness to make sure that understanding not all Minnesotans were impacted equally. And it gives us an opportunity. If the federal government's not going to move further, and we're certainly grateful for the work that was done, we're certainly grateful for the CARE Act dollars and, and some of the emergency powers that allowed us to put things in place to protect folks. Um, right now, we need them to do it again. Without them doing it, we put out the proposal that we need to move a package. I think what this forecast gives us, it gives us more certainty, which is a hard thing to come by in COVID, but it gives us a certainty and it also gives us a bridge path um, to that day on the very near horizon when we start vaccinating folks and we start moving towards that final phase of this COVID pandemic. Um, we can do that now. We should be focusing this on those small businesses most impacted. Again, through no fault of their own, their financial health was impacted to protect the greater good. They made decisions that kept our healthcare workers safe by making decisions about their own hospitality industry. Those are things that we need to, first of all, lift up, but secondly, make sure that we're all in this together. So I'm gonna encourage the legislature, and I know they're doing a great job with this, to keep the small business package moving forward. The mechanism that we use and how it ends up we can come together and reach a compromise on that, but I would just encourage them, and I, I think Commissioner Showalter's answer on speed and quickness of response in this crisis is really critical. I, I think that holds true for right now, that we bridge these folks to the new year, we bridge them to the potential for a federal relief package to small businesses, and we bridge this till we start getting folks vaccinated and the threat to our hospital starts to become reduced. We have that capacity now. And that means taking care of those workers. Uh, we need to extend federal unemployment. It's the surest way to get money to folks who are, who are laid off. That's going to expire. Their current uh, unemployment insurance expires shortly after Christmas. Um, we've suggested a 13 week extension of that. That should be the bridge and the time necessary for us to get there. It's a system that's in place. Again, I'm gonna give my thanks, um, very unheralded to the folks who manage the unemployment uh, insurance system. Uh, Minnesota was again, singled out as being, if not the most, one of the top two most efficient uh, systems for getting speed and accuracy of our unemployment insurance um, in an unprecedented volume. So I would say we need to do that. Um, and also we proposed a $500 one-time emergency payment to, uh, to the most struggling of our families. Uh, this would be children. And I, I just want to be clear, the folks that were most impacted by this are children and the families that are trying to support those children. So as we think about the future, I would urge the legislature to keep those fundamental principles in hand about what created 
our ability to be able to attack this pandemic, be able to create a testing system, be able to get the PPE, be able to do the things we've been able to do, what created the resiliency in this economy? And there's some principles there. One is, is keeping that rainy day fund and thinking about long-term budgeting and how those services that the state provides are needed at a crisis time. I'm concerned. I'm concerned, and we've asked our, uh, I've asked my commissioners, I've asked our agencies that that we needed to tighten belts all the way around. But I'm also concerned that some of the savings we're seeing is people potentially not getting the help they need at a time where they need it. And I think that sets us up as we look forward to the next budgeting. We're right in the heart of the worst part of this pandemic yet, but we have the capacity to take the lessons learned from this and lean forward. And one of the lessons is, is we're going to, and we have got to get our children back in school. We've got to get our littlest learners back there as quickly as possible. The place where we're at in the pandemic gives me a lot of hope that we are on the verge of being able to do that. Um, and, and we need to think about the investments Minnesota that made our economy one of the strongest in the country, made it so attractive was our education system. It's solid, it's good. Quality of life, our state parks, all of those things that we went to. So when we go to the next legislative session, the one thing I hope we're able to do is the smart choices we make build an economy for the future that allows us to not only enjoy the good times, but weather the bad times like we're in right now. So um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we're seeing across the state that spirit that we're in this together. I hope Minnesotans are, again, recognizing that overall, our picture may have improved some, just like the numbers we give on COVID, they can't just be numbers. There are families and businesses on the brink today. There are more people, one in eight families, wondering where they're going to get their next meal. Children concerned about one in five children potentially going hungry each night. There's challenges in this, but the good news of the day is we have the resources and the capacity and the fiscal stability and strength to be able to make a real difference in that. And I would encourage the legislature to do that, um, not just now, but looking into the next uh, the next budget cycle. And with that, Teddy, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Governor. So folks, let's do what we just did with Commissioner Showalter here. I'd invite folks to raise their hands and I'll just kind of call through in order here as I see hands pop up. Um, it looks like we've got Tom Hauser first in line here from KSTP. Tom, let's see if we can hear you. All right, Teddy, do you got me? I got you, thanks, go ahead. Uh, hello, Governor. I the MMB folks and state economists were saying they have factored in the fact that you have a four week pause on bars, restaurants and health clubs right now, but they have not factored in. What if that gets extended? A lot of Minnesotans are wondering now that you're saying Christmas family gatherings might be similar to Thanksgiving. Are you likely to extend past December 18th the current economic pause? Well, no, thank you, Tom, for the question. I, I think when this got asked yesterday, I again, I know this idea that it feels to people that things are sprung on them shortly. Our, our hope was, and we took a little detailed dive into the data yesterday, to start talking about data providing us trend data, where we're headed. And I think right now, it, it's certainly no secret that we had, I believe, over 15% positivity today in our numbers. While our overall numbers were a little lower, we're still in the middle of this. And so, what I'm asking folks is um, to recognize that the behavior changes we make are gonna have an incredible impact on what happens in those hospitals and what happens to the spread. Uh, one of the things that we've not been able to quantify, and I say we, this is uh, CDC uh, and, and everyone is, it is not so much the things, the restrictions that are put in place, it's the compliance and the sense of how serious people think things are. Uh, my hope is, is that we're going to start to see some results of folks making these choices, these good choices, starting to see again that if you do really want to protect the economy, these restrictions and some of the things we're doing on capacity are actually the ways to get there. Because if you make comparisons to states that did not do this, their, fitness, their financial situation isn't any better, and they've got a lot more deaths. So it's always striking that proper balance. And, and I don't want to play coy with folks. Um, I think it, it is likely that we are not out of this worst part of this yet over the next few weeks. Um, the game changer in this is um, we are preparing and there's the meeting at the White House today 
on vaccine distribution, what that starts to look like. I, I got to believe, Tom, and I'm hoping people view it this way, we're coming to the end of this thing. And, and whether that's in the next few months or not, that will be seen. But this is the time now, it seems to me, that if we could get just a little bit of digging in here, and I would encourage people, you can still help these businesses by ordering takeout. You can still help these businesses in ways, buying gift certificates, whatever it may be. But uh, at this point in time, we'll still wait to see what that data looks like. But I think Minnesotans know um, this is a challenging time and we're going to have more data in the next week or so of what happened over Thanksgiving. Governor, just as a quick follow-up, that was kind of a vague answer, and I realize you're still waiting for more data, but it sure sounds like you're planning on an extension, and there's a lot of people who can't reconcile the fact that Walmarts and Costco's are jammed with people, and health clubs can't have people at 25% capacity, socially distanced, trying to get healthy. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing a lot of that yourself, but it, it also sure sounds like this is going to be extended. Is that the way you are leaning? Well, I don't I don't pick it as leaning. And, and yes, I hear some of that, but I also hear from uh, emergency room physicians who are simply overwhelmed. I also hear from nurses and folks who, who recognize this. And again, I would tell people what we're learning, and it's not an exact science, and, and I've said the pain that these folks feel, one of the reasons I'm asking and pushing hard, we should be providing relief to those health clubs in this because we're asking them to stay home. Now, again, the layman's objective is, is that Walmart, the fact of the matter is people spend less time closer together in a larger place with masks on, not breathing as hard. And, and, and we keep coming back to this again. The exact science around it is still pretty hard to pin down, but the, the, the general overview is the longer you're near someone in a smaller space, and if you're doing things that make you breathe harder, the chance of infections go up. Um, I certainly, again, don't believe that there's a single health club that doesn't want their folks to stay healthy, increase their healthiness. Um, but the fact of the matter is, whether it's here, whether it's in the other 49 states, or whether it's across the world, the data seems to support that these are areas that have higher concentration. And when you're seeing a uh, huge amount of community spread right now, the odds are pretty good that someone in that health club, even at 25%, is probably asymptomatic positive. Now, you could say, well, the same thing is true of the Walmart. It's the distancing and the mass. So I would just tell them, I don't lean in any one way. I don't, the, the data doesn't give me an answer and say, here, you absolutely have to do this. We take it and see the direction it's going. I just think I have to be as candid with Minnesotans as possible. Our hospitals are at the highest capacity they've been. Our death rates for the last week was as high as any week in this pandemic. And our case positivity rate is the highest it's been. Um, if that changes, obviously we change with it. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Tom. Up next, we've got Ricardo Lopez with the Minnesota Reformer who's raising his hand here. Hi, Ricardo. Governor. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my question has to do with the with the stadium reserve. Um, the projected increase of 81 million, I think, brings it now to about 230 million, which is um, which I believe is more than necessary to pay for debt service. Uh, I'm curious if there's any ability to use those dollars for any other purposes, um, per, you know, just potentially even something like housing homeless uh, uh, Minnesotans who are experiencing homelessness. Well, there is, and, and I will just be candid on this one, Ricardo. I, I have suggested that in my budget, but I want to be also very cognizant of the legislature. Um, this is an area that they are not real keen at some in the legislature of using, and I'm, I'm, I want to be very candid that I understand where they're coming from on this, that this was a deal that was structured. Um, obviously, those revenues are up because of uh, of some of the behaviors and the, and the tax collections around that. Um, I always think that we should, uh, my mantra is everything should be on the table when we look at it. I will leave it at that, that, that the, the answer to your question is yes, the potential to be able to use it is there. Do I think that's going to happen? There's some real strong feelings um, amongst legislatures around this fund. So uh, you have to wait and see, I guess, on that one. Gotcha. And just a quick follow-up. Uh, with the budget surplus projected for this current biennium, um, do you have a ballpark number for, for how big you think the state uh, COVID-19 relief package should be, just from your end? 
No, not yet. We are working on that. I think you could expect to see that. And I, I don't want to uh, unduly influence what I think are very healthy and, and very positive discussions that are going on bipartisan, bicameral wise right now. Um, I do think, though, it gives us more certainty. Um, I, I certainly think, again, recognizing that there's good news in this, but there's segments of the economy that are really hurting. This gives us an opportunity to really target that. So I don't have the number for you, Ricardo, but but I'm thinking some of those early numbers you heard, you know, being batted around probably make more sense now um, that, that we can do a fairly robust package. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ricardo. Next in line here, we've got Theo Keith with Fox 9. Go ahead, Theo. Uh, hi, Governor. You mentioned the uh, hospital capacity and the uh, death rate earlier. I have to ask a question about the morgue, uh, which your administration uh, was installing shelving at yesterday and testing the cold storage uh, equipment. Um, even though um, we were told yesterday uh, that funeral homes haven't reached their baseline capacity yet, uh, let alone the surge, and deaths are still uh, far below expectations when the state bought the morgue. So why is the morgue being prepped? Yeah, well, first of all, um, in, from the beginning, as I said, I, I was not going to leave Minnesotans like we saw, whether it was in Italy, New York, or recently in El Paso, that we were going to have that capacity. Again, this facility was requested by the medical examiners, the morgues, the hospitals. Uh, we did receive a request um, a week or so ago from a hospital, but that wasn't the proper channel. We still had the capacity to cross level with other uh, funeral homes to be able to get that. Um, I think, again, seeing the surge that we have, um, due diligence has us to again, be prepared. And again, I, I knew from the beginning, and, and this is one that folks keep bringing up, um, those that haven't really done a lot to help us fight COVID have, have spent a lot of time complaining about this facility. And I said, I'll own this, that this is the insurance necessary that we don't hit those numbers. Um, I wanna make sure, and, and it's there. We started seeing some of those numbers starting to go up. The capacity numbers I asked about, I think, are probably setting at about 60% or a little more with our medical examiners and facilities. Some of it would depend on if you had these days like 101 days. If you happen to have a big surge, would that capacity overwhelm in the short run? So it's not that there is a imminent use of using this. It's just making sure that it's functional, it's ready to go. And, and I would note that... Um, that this facility more than likely will be paid out of federal funding. Um, other states did the same thing, um, preparing. And I, I, I'd like to think that uh, preparing for the dignity of our loved ones is, is worth uh, is worth it. Thanks, Governor. Thank you, Theo. Headed over to Esme Murphy with WCCO. Go ahead, Esme. Okay, can you hear me? We got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question for the governor is, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to hear these figures. And for those that have been drastically affected, like those in the hospitality industry or those, uh, you know, who have gyms, are going to want to know, when is the relief package coming? When is the special session coming? Uh, is this going to come before Christmas? Because it really doesn't look like help is coming from the federal government, at least soon. Yeah, no, and I'm still working them, uh, the federal government, I mean, um, I, I still think there's every reasonable opportunity that, that we get this thing done in the next week or so. Um, we have the numbers now. There, there's strong agreement that, um, you know, that we're doing the right thing on protecting our folks, asking folks to, to, uh, to curtail some of these activities. There's a responsibility to help try and uh, ease some of their pain. So I'll tell you right now, Esme, I'm, I'm very optimistic, um, obviously, the package won't look exactly like what I proposed. That's called compromise in a democratic system. Um, but I get no reason, and I'm not getting any, what I feel is, is pushback around the desire for us to do a package and get it done as quickly as possible. And I think the sooner rather than later. I think the timing, again, that Commissioner Showalter said, and we've seen so often, if we can keep these folks afloat, till we get into the better part of the new year and we're moving down a vaccination regime that is starting to spread and we get some federal help, which I think will come with the new administration potentially, um, there's every reason to believe that that that, that will make a difference. But, but I'm encouraging folks, let's do this. There's no reason that we can't have this thing wrapped up in the next week or so. Okay, but, and quickly a follow-up, what exactly are you proposing? Can you attach some dollar figures to that? 
Well, we've said, and, and I heard the numbers out there um, when when uh, the House uh, Democrats were doing their, you know, kind of back of the napkin uh, response, they were looking at around $300 million uh, in relief packages to small business. Obviously, the unemployment insurance is a little different animal. It gives us more flexibility. That's 13 weeks that would help individuals. Um, we're asking for the $500 for the most needy families. Um, so I think you're looking probably somewhere in that neighborhood. Again, there'll be a package probably come in at 600. There'll be one come in at 100. We'll figure it out. My biggest concern, though, is that this is targeted and timely, and it gets to those businesses who were left out of the PPP, who who didn't get. I mean, we were there for the Ford Motors, the the large airlines, and that's fine too. But there's a lot of these small businesses, especially in hospitality and others, that we could really get to right away. And it's it's my vision that we work a system out where, where they have this grant in their hand in the next few weeks to make a difference this month in their bills, their rent, and their, their payroll. Thank you, yes. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Esme. Next in line here, we have Patricia Lopez with the Star Tribune editorial board. Patricia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Governor. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the funding. So it sounds like the package could be between 300 and 600 million. Is that right? Is that the ballpark? Yeah, I'm just throwing in? those out there, Esme. What we did is we took the 14,000 restaurants and venues uh, that were impacted and figured out what it would take to impact them, plus the $500 to the to the folks that are receiving that have the most needed care and a few of the other things we were looking at. So probably I'm guessing somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, and optimally, what is the amount that you would be looking to get from the federal government um, in the first quarter of 2021? Well, that's the, I mean, the, I guess the $980 billion question today or the, or the three trillion. Um, I understand and I think the package that the House put out back in May was robust, was was smart, made a difference. But but I've been saying all along, we should just compromise. And, and what we really need is, is we needed this help for these small businesses and for individuals. We needed to make sure that we didn't lose eviction moratoriums or the capacity to be able to pay rent. And, and the states, I want to be candid, states do need some of this. But as you see, um, we're not in as dire of situation. So I, I think, at least according to this, I, I'm more than willing to to, to take a smaller package um, from the federal government. And, and if they did that, that would go an awful long ways to being able to make a lot of these folks whole. And, and again, like I would say, after this is over, we've got work to do. Um, we've got to, we're, we're gonna get these kids back in school as quickly as possible. Um, and it's gonna cost some once we do that. And, and again, I don't know what the school year will look like. Maybe we go through the summer to catch back up. Uh, I'm willing to talk to anybody about some of these ways to, to start thinking about that piece of it when we come out the other end, and that's going to take budgeting certainty. So okay, we'll see. Quick, quick follow up to that um, on the issue of unemployment. Um, is the state dependent on the feds for an enhanced unemployment? Are you looking at an extension or an enhancement? And how ac actually is that going to get funded? We would like them to do it, but we are willing to do it. They should do it. The federal government should be doing it. This is a failure. And I'm, I'm on record saying it. And if that irritates my Democratic friends in the legislature and my Republican friends in, in Washington, so be it. They should do it. If they aren't going to do it, the state of Minnesota will do it. And the way it works is we, like every other state, I think 48 or 49 other states, are using federal government funds to backfill their UI until we build back up that uh, surplus. And what you're able to do is they just put it on your tab and you pay it back. My hope would be is if they're going to capitulate and not do the extension and help us out, the least they can do is suspend the interest on those payments and we'll get it paid back over time. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. One more question here today, Governor. We've got Mary LaHammer with TPT. Mary, go ahead. Thank you, Governor. Earlier you said that folks who are most impacted are kids and you want to get school kids back in the classroom, but the budget numbers showed more than 12,000 12, students have been lost from the public school system, maybe some to private school, maybe homeschool, maybe delaying kindergarten, but isn't it possible a significant amount of children in Minnesota have just dropped out of school, dropped out of the numbers, and what does this do to exacerbate the achievement gap and the equity concerns we were already facing? 
Yeah, I think it, it is possible. And that's 12,600 out of 870,000. But here's my thing is, the number I really care about is one, each individual kit. And, and I think you're right. We're losing some of it. You saw the numbers coming off St. Paul schools. I want to thank them for getting data out early. I got one of them sitting right here in my house. I know the grades are going down, and I know this is harder than it should be. So, yes, I do think it probably exacerbated, no doubt about it, it did exacerbate the achievement gap, the inequities. That's kind of my point, Mary, that, that I'd like to kind of set the tone. When we come back next year, um, all of those things I talked about, I, I want, again, I certainly didn't envision my time as governor being the COVID governor, if you will. I'm the education governor is how I viewed myself. I want to make a difference in this. I said, judge me by closing that gap. Judge me what happens to our youngest ones. I'm trying to make the case that this gives us an opportunity and we've convened a group of folks to help us. Let's come back and be creative around education. Let's come back and be creative about education funding. Let's come back and try and figure out where those where we failed those kids, where COVID dropped them out of the system, and how do we get them back in and make up that difference? And Governor, if I could follow up, can you make up that difference if kids have really lost a year or even two years of school at this point? Well, the research is hard. The research is hard. All of us know this, especially the youngest ones. I think that's why you're seeing across the country, and us included, there's this scramble to get those little ones back in school as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Um, you know, this decision about how we're going to do vaccinations, um, obviously, with the ethical perspective as our healthcare workers and all that. Um, there's experts will do in this. I would weigh in on this that, that we need to get teachers, especially those elementary teachers, vaccinated so that we can get all our kids back in school all across the state. Um, if there's a way for us to think about that, I'm asking to do that. But you're right. The research is hard. That's why I think we're going to have to be more creative. Um, on, on what a school year looks like. What have we learned in this? I mean, and there's groups that are that are doing things that we weren't doing that we should incorporate. Okay, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mary. Governor, I know you've got to run on to the next thing here. Thank you, I'm gonna hand it, I'm gonna, if you have a closing remarks here, and then I'm gonna hand it back to Ellen with MMB. No, just thank you all for your time. Thank you, Governor. All right, Team MMB, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you, Teddy, and thank you, um, Governor Walls. Um, Commissioner Showalter, if you have any closing comments, now would be um, the time to share those. If not, we can wrap here. Um, I think uh, that should take care of it as usual. I just want to re remind people that there are materials available on the MMB website. Uh, there will be more materials available on Thursday. So those of you who are familiar with the longer document with all the tables and information, uh, that will be available. Obviously, uh, we'll be watching how accurate we are with the monthly revenue updates that also get shown uh, and are published on uh, our department website. So I uh, just appreciate uh, all your attention and uh, more information will continue to be coming from our team. So thank you very much.
just shows a cautiously hopeful picture of our state's budgetary future. In the legislature, it is our responsibility to be careful stewards of taxpayer dollars. It is also up to us to make sure we don't leave anyone behind as we continue our fights against COVID-19 and to rebuild our economy. We know, as today's numbers remind us yet again, that the economic effects of the pandemic are not being felt equally, that lower wage workers, those who can afford it least, are bearing it the most. As we face the challenging in ensuring stability in revenue and spending in the upcoming budget cycle, we must keep our options open and we must be laser focused that we don't add to the burden of working Minnesotans, our frontline workers. It will take all of us working together in the upcoming legislative session to get Minnesota back on track to a bright economic future for the state, for our communities, and for our neighbors. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, this is Melissa Hartman. Uh, duh, right? Um, hello, everybody. It's been a while. I feel like I'm uh, just getting back in the policy swing of things as we uh, wrap up the election season and start to look forward to the 2021-2022 session. This is undoubtedly good news today that the budget forecast is much more positive than uh, the picture we received in May and in July but we still really have a long ways to go. If we look at the uh, budget picture for the next two years, we have a projected $1.3 billion deficit, not including inflation. So if you include inflation, you assume things cost more in the future than they do today, uh, we're looking at about a $2.6 billion deficit going forward. So we have to have tempered expectations, but we do have enough money in the short term to provide some assistance to those who need it the most. COVID-19 is not hitting everybody evenly, and some of the people who are being hit the hardest need some economic relief to get through these tough times, and we should be able to do that. So I'm looking forward to working with um, all of the caucuses in the legislature and the governor's office on hopefully getting some economic relief soon. And I'll turn it over to the majority leader. Good afternoon. Today's budget forecast does make one thing very clear. Minnesota is in a significantly stronger financial position than we thought we would be last spring. It's very good news for a lot of Minnesotans. With our state on stronger financial footing and with a light at the end of the tunnel on vaccines, we now face a choice. We can choose to support the working families who've been hit hardest by the pandemic, or we can prioritize the rich and the well-connected who've benefited so much from past supports from the federal government. The relief bill that we presented last week puts working families first. The vast majority of Minnesotans support common sense steps like strengthening unemployment insurance and support for small businesses. Now the question is whether Senate Republicans will join us in that. We believe they will and we are making good progress. But as we look out across this next budget session, the next legislative session, we need to not only provide emergency relief now, but we have to make sure that Minnesota families, Minnesota small businesses, service workers, the communities of color, the people who are hardest hit by this pandemic are first in line for recovery. This does not have to be like other crises where thousands of families fall into poverty while the rich and powerful get bailed out. Minnesota should put those who are struggling the most first and this budget forecast shows us that we have the resources to do it. And with that, we'll uh, go to Q&A. First question was from Bill Werner, go ahead. Bill, no, nope. all right, we'll go to Peter Callahan We'll come back to Bill. Uh, Peter's question, can you update us with as many specifics as possible on the relief talks? What is the best estimate, uh, estimate of timeline? So we have been working ever since the most recent round of restrictions were announced to come up with a package of relief for small businesses, support for workers who are unemployed and for Minnesota's neediest families. Uh, in the House uh, with the DFL, we've worked closely with the governor and we've been negotiating pretty seriously with House Republicans and think that we could have a package in rough shape potentially as soon as the end of this week. The challenge is that we need more engagement from Senate Republicans to finalize a package for an early special session. We will have a special session for sure on December 14th or so to debate the governor's emergency powers once more. And when we come into session on that date, I think it would be very difficult for Senate Republicans to not join the Minnesota House in passing a relief package. 
All right, we'll jump back to Bill. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me all right? I'm, I'm sorry about that. I didn't unmute. Um, the, the chorus from Republicans, both House and Senate, is um, no tax increases. We've got a surplus, um, and I think they would argue, and I know, Mr. Leader uh, Winkler, that you uh, talked about working families, but I think they would argue that also we can't have any tax increases that might affect job creators or struggling businesses in any way. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, Minnesota has a lot of people who are doing extremely well. The economic shift has focused uh, consumer spending more on durable goods and things that people are buying and away from services. So this has been a very unfair economic hit to a lot of people. So I think when we're looking at a recovery, we have to get money and resources into the hands of families who can spend it quickly and start demanding resources as we start to reopen, start demanding services as we reopen. And a, a blanket across the board anti-tax message just makes sure that people who are already doing well, people who are rich, people who are well-connected are going to be served first. That's the kind of thing that we've done in the past, and Minnesota should not do this time. And if we look at the 22-23 time frame, we are talking about a significant budget deficit of $2.6 billion. And so if Republicans come into that with the perspective that no new revenue is needed. What they're saying is people who are hardest hit by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic have to face cuts in the future. So my hairstylist, who I haven't seen nearly as much as I would have this year, who's probably uh, had a, a significant income reduction, uh, the, the grocery store workers who are working on the front line, what the Republican position is saying, it's okay to cut the services at our local schools. It's okay to see cutbacks in Minnesota care where working families pay a portion of their health care expenses. Um, I, I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think that's okay. As the majority leader has pointed out, there are people who are doing fine and whose standard of living is not adversely impacted. In fact, some people are doing better. Um, I'm sure there's some uh, folks who own uh, different stocks in retail companies that are doing very well at this point in time. And so for Republicans to take the perspective that facing a $2.6 billion deficit in the next two-year budget cycle that revenue is off the table is really irresponsible until we look at how um, cuts to get to 2.6 billion would affect everyday Minnesotans. And our friends on the Republican side of the aisle are very fond of saying that they will cut things. One, one thing they have a little trouble doing is identifying those things in state government that they would cut. They're usually pretty good at finding things that they would spend money on, but they're not so uh, good at identifying things that they would actually cut. The theory of cuts is different than the actuality of taking a service that someone currently gets in terms of educational services at their local school or healthcare services for working families and cutting that back. And so we'll see what sort of a budget they assemble in the 21 legislative session and if they're able to put their money where their mouth is on the concept of cuts. Could we also get Senator Kent to weigh in on that, if you don't mind, Senator, uh, because you've got a a little lighter lift, maybe potentially to convince. Uh, <laughs> Bill, uh, Senator Kent had to drop off for a oh, uh, previous okay, scheduled three. meeting. So okay, we will move you. on. Uh, next question is from Theo Keith. Yeah, back to the uh, um, economic relief bill. The governor just suggested that uh, it could be anywhere from 300 million to 600 billion. Um, that's kind of a big difference between those two numbers. Can you narrow it down for us? What's your target number? Well, First of all, we needed the forecast to come out today to know what kind of range we were talking about. When we started uh, this process, we put together some rough numbers that showed uh, that providing $25,000 to 14,000 businesses equals $350 million. Uh, the, the challenge that we face is not necessarily arriving at a dollar amount, it's getting the money out quickly. And it is very difficult to create a, a program and grant application uh, type system and get the money out the door in a way that would actually help businesses. Uh, I did a town hall last night with Representative Wolgamott and St. Cloud and really put the question to a lot of small business owners there, you know, is time or targeting more important? And they said timeliness is by far the most important thing. So uh, getting money out the door quickly, possibly using the Department of Revenue uh, to transfer directly into uh, businesses' bank accounts is uh, the way that we can do it quickly. And um, we will have to have discussions uh, over this next uh, several days after we have the forecast to come up with a specific dollar amount. 
is the 300 to 600 million, which is again, a very wide gap. Is, is that a fair number for what you in the House DFL are targeting? Well, I think you have to consider the context. So the unemployment insurance extension of 13 weeks uh, doesn't come out of the general fund. It comes out of the unemployment insurance trust fund. Uh, and that could be anywhere between, uh, you know, 400 to 500 million dollars. So it depends on how you're counting the dollars. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned twenty five thousand dollars. That would be a substantial uh, increase for what a lot of businesses received through past rounds. So it could make a big difference. The lion's share of those are restaurants and bars. So it really would uh, target the hospitality industry. Uh, and so the range that the governor mentioned is uh, is, you know, potentially very reasonable. But we haven't had the chance to even sit down with Senate Republicans to hear where they're coming from on dollar amounts at all. And so until they engage, it's hard for us to speculate where we will end up. There are also less obvious downstream um, uh, impacts. So for example, the, the businesses that own the commercial space that many restaurants lease. Um, so if we're able to provide some assistance to restaurants what impact does that have on them being able to stay in business and the other people who could be affected? So the difficulty we have in crafting a package is it will be um, impossible to be precise and, and to make sure that we're directing aid to everyone who's impacted. And at the same time, we at the state level cannot do enough to hold people harmless, that we really need the federal government to step up to the plate with the kind of programs they did um, in March, the PPP type of loans, which are really substantial um, investments that allow companies to maintain their payroll over a period of weeks. And I just, would, yeah, I think the speaker is exactly right. The scale of support needed for businesses and families in Minnesota is larger than what the state can provide. We are talking about emergency short-term relief to hopefully get through to the part, point where things can be open safely or, and the public feels confident in going to them which is really the key point here, or the federal government steps in. Uh, last night I was talking with the owner of Great River Bowl, a family owned uh, bowling alley in St. Cloud. Uh, they've been at their business for 41 years. He, and the owner said they've been, their family has spent 41 years building up uh, their business to the point where it is now. And in eight months, it's virtually all gone. That is the dramatic scale of what is happening to so many uh, Minnesota small businesses and the workers who are, are there working in them. And it just is a mammoth uh, challenge that is larger than what the state government can do in the long run. So we have work to do in the big picture, short term, the package that we're working on is something that can help these businesses get through hopefully. Okay, next question is from Mary LaHammer. Yeah, I have kind of a follow up in this vein, but short term and long term, I want to talk about the volatility of the forecast and budget and numbers. So first short term, if the governor extends the current pause, which he's hinting he may very well do through the next holiday through the end of the year, how can we know the scale of the emergency relief for the current pause if extended. And then longer term, how confident are you budgeting in the upcoming legislative session being that the numbers in this budget forecast have already moved billions? Can you accurately budget with just a February forecast? Do you wanna go ahead, Ryan? Or Well, on the, on the scale, I mean, what we're uh, contemplating and have been from the beginning is something like a 60 day bridge and the, the theory being it would give potentially a new administration in Washington time to put together a package or the current Congress or administration to agree to something. Uh, it would come at a time when vaccines would be coming on the market and we would potentially have a better understanding of the path of the pandemic in Minnesota and the level of uh, safety to get reopened. It isn't like it's a guarantee that when we get to that 60 day period, we're ready to take off again, but it's at least allows us to get that far down the road. And with regard to the uncertainty, as we look forward, I think you know some of the some of the questions from the um, MMB presser were were really good questions, and and some of Commissioner Showalter's answers were really good answers. You know, he and Governor Dayton structured this reserve, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to make choices. It buys us some time where we don't have to react as quickly as other states who don't have that cushion. At the same time, in a situation where we have this volatile forecast, 
we're really cautioned, um, you know, and, and, I, and I hesitate to say this because I'm sure you'll bring it up later when I propose to use some of the reserves if we get there, but we are cautioned to be careful about using those reserves. This is our first pandemic that all of us have lived through and have watched an economy perform. And I think it's very difficult to say we can see this wild swing from the May and July numbers to what we're hearing in um, November. We don't know what we'll see in February. I would like to think that the vaccines will work and that we will be good at distributing them. And we'll be, you know, by the time May rolls around, we'll have substantial distribution. I'm hopeful, but um, what if that doesn't work out, right? So we have to have a budget that is structurally balanced, that's looking to the future, that can anticipate some more bumps in the road. And, and I think it's really important to realize that when we look out into the future, providing services to human beings is just as important as the numbers in the bank, right? So we don't serve the state well by uh, just making the numbers work, but substantially decreasing the amount of services that they receive from the governor, government, whether that's in education, transportation infrastructure, and health and human services. Can I quickly follow up? Does that mean you're loath to drain the reserves or use a great deal of them just in case there's more coming? I, I am loath to drain them. I think that it is a rainy day fund and it is pouring. This is the reason that we save money. You can bet that every finance committee in the Minnesota House of Representatives will be asking every entity that they finance about their reserves. So University of Minnesota, what are your reserves? Metro Transit, what are your reserves? Um, there's a reason we have reserves and this moment in time is that reason. But since we don't know what the future brings, you know, God forbid another strain of the virus or God forbid some unforeseen complication with the vaccines, we do probably not want to get down to zero. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next question is from Ricardo Lopez. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, my question has to do with um, was something I asked the governor earlier. I'd asked him if he would support using any of the stadium reserve funding uh, to pay for other uses, um, particular housing uh, for those experiencing homelessness. I'm and he indicated that there might be some legislative resistance to something like that. So I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, legislative leaders about, you know, whether they think any of that uh, stadium reserve money should be used for other purposes, uh, including um, homelessness, as as the governor is proposing. Well, it's a state account with a surplus in it, like many others. Um, there is a possibility of refinancing those bonds, but not for a year or two at significant savings to the public. So yes, there's a surplus there now, and it does look appealing to, to meet immediate needs, but we have to balance that against the possibility in the future of refinancing and saving uh, taxpayer dollars. So I know it's something that has experienced considerable resistance in the Minnesota uh, Republican-led Senate. It is um, a, a fund that has given us some pause as well in the House because we're keen to take advantage of the savings for refinancing. But like all other state funds, there are trade-offs to look, to look at when we look at that particular source of money. Great, thank you. Uh, next one is Dave Oreck. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, just to clarify something, uh, is there actually anything in any of your guys' proposals that involves raising taxes or fees in any way? There is no proposal on the table for emergency relief that involves any kind of increase in taxes or fees. Uh, in fact, we're looking at uh, short-term uh, reductions or eliminations or extensions on regulatory fees for a lot of businesses in the hospitality industry. All right. Uh, Bill Werner has another question. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, I'm wondering about um, what is the what are the potential sticking points as far as bringing this um, restaurant and bar assistance package actually to fruition? And is one of them whether, in fact, unemployment benefits ought to be extended? Because Republicans have mentioned that on several occasions. Is that going to be a problem area in terms of getting agreement on that? Uh, yeah, Bill, I would say that we are making good progress and having very positive conversations with relatively few sticking points with House Republicans. The sticking point we face is that Senate Republicans have not yet engaged with a proposal. And so uh, we are hoping that they will quickly 
uh, join us in, in working on this. Uh, Senate Democrats have been involved, uh, and I'm hoping in the next day or so we'll get Senate Republicans. Hopefully the forecast frees them up to come to the table with some ideas about what they would like to do. But there is, a, I think, pretty strong understanding that we need to help workers and we need to help small businesses. And today's forecast should show that we have the reserves uh, in place and the uh, forecast in place to be able to do that. So you have not had any conversations with anyone in the Senate, uh, Mr. Leader, about the unemployment uh, benefit extension portion of it? Have you got any sense from them at all? I realize they haven't weighed in with a formal package yet, but... We have had uh, some initial conversations, but nothing uh, in great depth. Um, I will say that um, there seems to be uh, some House Republican uh, belief that we need to do both things in some way or another. Okay, in the Senate, you, you don't have, do you have a clear I don't, I don't know their position on the issue. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. One significant piece that should be easy for us to talk Republicans in the House and in the Senate into doing, and we've had um, resistance that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, is a $500 uh, assistance to, to needy families where we, we invest $100,000 of state resources to access $12 million from the federal government. So we put $12 million worth of spending into Minnesota's state economy with only a $100,000 investment. It would go to Minnesota's neediest families. It would almost instantly go back into the economy and serve businesses, um, restaurants for takeout, you know, you name it. It's, it's an econ economic stimulus. So I'm hopeful we'll be able to include that in this package at this time. In, in, you know, the holiday season, it seems entirely appropriate that this is part of the package and we should uh, encounter more success with Republicans, hopefully this time of year than we've had earlier in the year. Thanks, Madam Speaker. All right, next up is Esme Murphy. Yeah, hey there. Um, and forgive me, I had to dip out a little bit, but I had a couple of questions. Um, the majority leader, uh, Mr. Winkler, suggested or floated uh, $20,000 for each of 14,000 businesses. I think that was last week. Maybe it was the last the week before. Is that still something that's realistic? And also, uh, there had been sort of indications that perhaps there, there would be an earlier a special session, but now it sounds like maybe not. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in our experience in negotiating uh, uh, agreements with Senate Republicans in the last year or so is that it takes time. We got a bonding bill done, but we got it done in uh, October. We got uh, business relief, child care expenses, and other things done, but we got it done uh, in uh, July. We uh, sent money to local governments. Uh, we kind of got in an agreement, but the governor ended up doing that on his own. And we got a police reform and accountability ability package, accountability package passed, but that wasn't done until August uh, after George Floyd's murder. So we get things done, but it takes time. I think the speculation about when we have a special session is really just an estimate of how long it takes to negotiate this out. If we can get it done faster and we can get it out uh, a week early, that would probably be beneficial. The question is, is it useful to have two special sessions or can we just wrap this up into one and be done? Thank you. Um, legislators like other human beings are good with uh, having a deadline and uh, with the governor's 30 day uh, peacetime emergency renewal coming up on December 14th, that creates a natural deadline. That gives us this week to get an agreement in concept next week to get the details uh, hopefully wrapped up and heard publicly and you know uh, a bill posted and then action on Monday the 14th, which is actually not that long away. And I also wanna point out that the approach we're taking with putting money directly out in, in lump sums to businesses based on category through the Department of Revenue allows us to move very quickly. Uh, I don't have an exact timeline, but if we passed a bill on the 14th, money would be out the door before the end of the month. And is that $20,000 to $25,000 per year, is that still ballpark? I mean, it's entirely scalable. So the question is, what can we get agreement on as far as a total dollar amount? And then how would we divide that out? So uh, that's where uh, we started with our math. And uh, we'll see where we get with Republicans on theirs. Thank you. Uh, Pat Lopez had a clarifying question, Madam Speaker, on the 100 k for $12 million the MFIP thing you mentioned earlier. Yeah, there's $12 million in TANF funding that we can access 
if we invest the basically the state dollars are the processing to to get the money and to get it out. Okay, and with that, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions. I don't know if you have any closing comments, uh, leaders. I just have one, and that is that this pandemic affects all Minnesotans, but it affects some Minnesotans a lot more deeply than others, not just in health and lost lives, but the frontline workers who have sacrificed so much, uh, teachers and school officials and these small businesses that have been hit so hard. We are really asking them to do public health work for all of us. And it is only fair that the rest of us pitch in some resources to help them get through this. This is absolutely essential to get this done and it is exactly why we have a budget reserve. It is why Minnesota invests in each other across the state because we believe in each other. We believe that we have to treat each other fairly. And this calls for us to take action in a, in a way that we don't, other, we don't usually see. I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
Very good. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'll just give some brief remarks, and then uh, Representative New and Representative Garofalo are here with me as well, and we'll let them uh, chime in if they like, uh, and then we'll take some questions. So uh, first of all, uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, obviously, good news for Minnesota today uh, with the forecast getting significantly better. Um, really, I think who needs to be applauded for that are, are Minnesotans who have worked so hard to find ways of uh, working through this pandemic and um, still uh, maintaining some level of, of normalcy in their businesses and in their jobs. Um, so we certainly appreciate the hard work that they have done. Uh, the surplus that we have in the current biennium obviously uh, belongs to Minnesotans and the credit for that belongs to Minnesotans. Um, I also think it probably points out that the numbers were somewhat flawed uh, in the previous uh, forecast, although I don't fault anyone for that because it was very difficult to try to predict uh, how our revenues were going to come in uh, in such a uh, weird time. So um, I think it's good news. I think you know our caucus has uh, has kind of taken the lead and and we're at the forefront of proposing some uh, relief to Minnesota businesses uh, during this economic uh, downturn. Uh, both the first time uh, that the governor uh, shut businesses down and, and now the second time. Um, uh, Representative Dave Baker has been working uh, hard with uh, leaders from the other caucuses to put together a, a package that we think um, you know, will, will help those businesses get through this tough time and weather this storm. So um, we're optimistic that we can get that passed fairly quickly. Uh, I think there are still some uh, outstanding points that we need to work on, but um, I think folks are coming together, so we're optimistic about that. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Representative New. Thank you, Leader Doubt. Uh, I, I would just say, you know, this uh, to echo Kurt's comments. This this really is good news. And um, as as we've been discussing, we've been working on a relief package. I've been I've been working with that working group to make that happen. And hopefully, this um, makes the path to getting that done just a little bit easier. Our, our small businesses are really hurting right now um, and, and we need to get that relief package done. So, and I'll turn the time over to Representative Graffalo. Uh, thank you, Leader Doubt, and thank you, uh, Deputy Leader New. First of all, can I just get a wave that you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. So um, obviously really good news today, uh, really good news, but I would caution uh, Minnesotans to remember that uh, arsonists make very bad firefighters. And so we're trying to put out these fires that are damaging small business. Let's listen to small business owners and let's ignore those who want to tell small businesses what to do. Uh, that's really the important thing here is that we have we're going to get out and help our small businesses. Big businesses have benefited from these government restrictions. Um, they don't need our assistance right now. Uh, it's the small businesses, main street businesses, family owned businesses that need our help. And uh, I'm confident that Representative Baker, uh, working with Representative New, Representative Dowd, uh, and members of the DFL as well, can put together a really good package and help us out. Uh, going forward, I think it's important that we recognize that Minnesota, if we make some smart decisions here in the next couple of weeks and months, restore our small businesses, that the Minnesota economy is set to boom in 2021. That if you see the, uh, the, develop, the rapid deployment of vaccines, uh, as well as this uh, unbridled enthusiasm and confidence that Minnesotans want to have to get out, we can uh, get the vaccines to avoid the 2021 20, can be a year of amazing opportunities. There's really no need to be uh, taking any more of it, money out of the private sector and putting it into the government. Uh, let's let the economy return to growth. Uh, that'll accomplish some good things. Uh, one thing we do need to be aware of is to recognize that with the commercial property tax markets and commercial property tax valuations in decline and less usage, our current property tax system in Minnesota is going to mean, uh, will mean that that burden is going to shift on the residential pay rate payers. We should stop that in 2021. We should use some of the uh, the budget reserve to provide a temporary relief to alleviate that property tax burden, that if we take no action, property taxes will shift from commercial taxpayers to residential taxpayers that need to be stopped. And uh, I think a, a, a person that we can be looking to uh, for good advice in this as we work with Senate Republicans and work with the Democrats is let's rely on the expertise uh, in, uh, of Senator Tom Bach, who is uniquely positioned with his experience to offer some good advice to both sides of the aisle. And I would hope that our, uh, our Senate colleagues, I know Senator Gazelka has already done that. I would hope that Senator Kent, uh, the governor's office, majority uh, party DFL in the House, uh, listen to his advice. 
right. Uh, do we have some questions? Yep. Uh, but that Bill will open Werner, it up to, Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead, Kurt. I was just going to go through them, Andrew. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Bill, uh, we'll just go in the order uh, in the chat. Uh, Bill Werner, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, we asked the uh, the Democrats about tax increases, uh, and we, we know what your stance on that is. And uh, they said that there are some folks in this economy who are doing very well because of the switch in consumer spending patterns as are forced by the pandemic, and therefore saying just across the board, no tax increases is simply going to benefit um, uh, folks uh, who are already in good shape. Uh, and not have uh, money available to help folks who really need the help. How do you respond to that? You know, I think that's a a, a statement uh, that probably has its roots in uh, uh, in in uh, political talking points and in dividing people. This is not, you know, it's it's naive and ignorant for us to say that anybody's doing really well uh, during this pandemic. Um, are there people who haven't been hurt by this? Certainly, there are, but uh, there are others who have been. Uh, hurt incredibly bad, and and uh, there are businesses uh, that that just frankly won't make it through this. Uh, I think the hospitality industry has said that you know potentially as much as forty or fifty percent of restaurants will not make it out the other end of of this pandemic. Um, uh, movie theaters. I mean, there's just so many uh, industries that are going to be hit really hard by this. So um, you know, to try to even use words like that, uh, it, it, that that's pretty shameful to to try to pit one group of people in this pandemic against another group of people, and to try to do that for political gain, I think is irresponsible. Let's together just uh, you know gather around this problem, figure out who needs the help, and try to figure out how to help them. Um, it, you know, pitting one group of people against another is is really a, a a bad political strategy and, and really, I think, lacks uh, the kind of, kind of leadership that's necessary right now during this pandemic. So um, I, I hope that they'll uh, uh, stop using that talking point and, and start actually trying to help people. Anyone else on that one? Otherwise, Anne, Hank? did you want to chime in on this one? Uh, no, that's fine. Okay. All right, next up, we've got uh, Theo Keith. Uh, hey, so you guys put out your uh, economic relief proposal uh, framework last week. The governor put out his on the same day. It seemed uh, pretty promising that something would happen soon. And uh, now a week's gone by and we haven't heard anything else. Uh, and uh, just now, House Democrats said the Senate GOP hasn't engaged with them yet on this. So uh, is this uh, slipping through? everybody's fingers, it seems a lot less optimistic than it was a week ago. Well, you know, I think we're still optimistic. I think all along the Senate Republicans have been saying, let's wait and see what the forecast says before we uh, proceed too far, just simply because we needed to know what sort of resources we had available uh, to help Minnesota businesses. So um, they are certainly uh, taking a cautious approach. Um, we obviously rolled our package out early, but we had been working on it probably earlier than anybody else. Uh, as I said earlier, we had taken the, the forefront and the lead and um, really understanding that Minnesota businesses were hurting and we're going to need some help in the second round of shutdown. Um, and we knew how important that was and, and wanted to proceed uh, fairly quickly. Um, I don't want to fault anybody else uh, you know, for, for having a slower reaction and a more thoughtful reaction. Uh, to wait and see what the numbers were, but we knew this was going to be necessary. Um, I'll also say that the, the the legislative leaders received a call from the governor's office and uh, from MMB uh, probably almost two weeks ago now indicating that the, the fiscal situation for the state has changed significantly um, and that they would do an earlier forecast and it would reflect that uh, uh, there was enough of a change in the current biennium that we would not need to access the reserves in this biennium. So that told us right away that um, things had had uh, improved pretty significantly. So uh, we were we were going off of that information and knew that we probably didn't need to wait. Uh, but um, I'm certain that the Senate GOP understands the importance of helping uh, our Minnesota businesses, uh, you know, weather this storm and make it through to the other side. Um, the most important thing that we can do is make sure that when this pandemic is over and, and when the vaccine is, is distributed and, and the, the pandemic uh, and the concern over the pandemic has, has uh, gone away and, and we're returning back to normal, that there are businesses and there are jobs available for people uh, on the other end of this. And, and um, some of them are going to need some, some life support to get, to get through this. So um, that's what we're committed to. And, and I'm sure that uh, the others will be there with us. Later doubt if I can jump in on this as well. 
Uh, you know, I have been working with this working group and, and as Leader Doubt just talked about this division not being helpful, you know, this narrative that the Senate GOP is not engaged, uh, I, I, I'm not real under, understanding of why um, that narrative is out there other than to sow division as some sort of negotiating tactic, which I really don't understand. Uh, we've been engaged with the Senate GOP in these conversations the entire time. Um, so th that narrative is just not true. They, they actually are actively engaged every day in different conversations. What's actually more concerning to us is, you know, the governor put out a plan, but he has actually not been engaged in the conversations with us. He has not, uh, he's been engaged with the House DFL. He's not been engaged at all with House Republicans or Senate Republicans. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think we all were hopeful and appreciated the governor's tone when he, um, when he proposed his package that he was really looking for a bipartisan uh, solution. Um, and, and we're hoping we, we still see that from the governor, but to this point, we have not. Uh, Peter Callahan, did that cover, kind of cover your question or did you it, want to jump it, in? It almost did. Can you tell us who you're working with in the Senate Republican caucus specifically, what, what senators? Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, I know that Senator Pratt is working on some of this um, and I'm not sure if I know, they've divided up the work and it's on a spreadsheet that we have. I just don't have that spreadsheet right in front of me. So each each part of the bill is divided up to the uh, uh, committee chairs in those specific areas. I'm not sure if Pat or Ann has that information right in front of them. I don't have it right in front of me, but I know Senator Pratt has part of it and I forget who has the other parts, but, um, and I know we have had conversations with uh, with those senators and those conversations have been ongoing. Peter Duff, you're exactly correct. It's uh, Senator Pratt leads the initiative over in the Senate. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, we put forward a proposal for $400 million in small business assistance. Uh, as soon as we can just get other people to recognize that and approve that, we can move forward on helping small businesses. Unfortunately, uh, the omnibus Christmas tree approach is starting now where we're seeing other interest groups trying to attach things to small business relief. If we can just get everyone in the legislature focused on giving that $400 million to small businesses, uh, let let other people debate other things and in individual bills separate from that, but let's not hold up assistance for our small businesses or uh, for the uh, wish lists of others. All right, uh, Mary Lahammer, and then Tom Hauser had his hand up. We'll go to him next. Yeah, I have a question actually quickly for all three based on uh, Garofalo said earlier about the economy set to boom in 2021 with the release of the vaccine. I've asked questions before about modeling behavior and wearing masks. I wanna know if the three lawmakers on the call all plan to get the vaccine and will encourage others to do so. You know, I, there's probably varying degrees of, of people's comfort level with it. I, I am very, very confident. Everything I've heard about the vaccine um, is uh, certainly positive and indicates that it will be successful. Um, I would get it on day one. However, I'm certainly willing to forego that because there are people who are at much, much higher risk uh, who should be taking it sooner than I. So um, although we are a pretty, uh, a pretty essential, uh, you know, the, the legislature's uh, duty is pretty essential. And, and frankly, if it were to help us get back to the Capitol um, and get face-to-face -face and in-person hearings. I think those things are really important. So I would very strongly recommend that we give it to anybody in the legislature who does uh, feel that they are high risk or that they have family members at home who are high risk, which I don't consider myself in that um, in that bucket. But uh, I, I would take it myself. I would take it right away. Uh, but I, I know that it's I, I shouldn't be taking it right away. I should leave it for people who are at a higher risk and I'll let the others answer as well. Thank you. And that Pat, was well that was well said. I'm not sure there's anything to add. Yeah, I, uh, Mary, I had COVID in October. So my primary concern is just making sure I don't take something else with the vaccine. But the moment that it's available publicly or to the legislature, uh, absolutely. The, the sooner the better. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tom Hauser. Yeah, Representative Dowd, I don't know if you listened to the governor a short time ago, but he strongly hinted that he will continue the shutdown of bars, restaurants, and health clubs past December 18th. Uh, you have said in the past that the governor picks winners and losers in these economic shutdowns. Do you still believe that? And, and do you think that this shutdown as it stands now 
should not be extended and maybe even shortened? Well, you know, there's a couple of things I'd like to say to that. Number one, I want to thank the governor for, you know, doing what what I think he thinks is right and, and you know, for, for doing what I think he, he thinks will keep Minnesota safe. Um, but I, I, I want to be critical of him at the same time in that I think he has really missed an opportunity to work with the legislature um, and to include us in the process. I'll, I'll point out for you, not that I, I think I need to, because I think you can see it as well, but there are no legislative hearings going on on COVID. We're not talking about distribution of the vaccine or, uh, you know, there's, uh, we haven't even started hearings on the aid package yet. We're having behind the scenes conversations, but, um, you know, with the impacts of businesses, uh, the, the impacts on, on, on uh, workers, uh, you know, those sorts of things, our education system, there's so many things that we could be having hearings on so that we can be engaged. Um, but I, I do fault the governor a little bit in that he has failed to engage with the legislature. And I, I think it's, it's incumbent on him to, uh, to include us and show some leadership. The pandemic is not a partisan issue. And, and um, mm -hmm. I think it's an opportunity for us all to work together. Um, I, I also think that as part of our, uh, you know, aid package proposal, we talked about opening up a couple of uh, uh, different uh, segments and there probably are others. I think we should find ways to open these businesses safely. That's the key. Um, but the two that I would mention health clubs, we think that health clubs are an essential thing that that help Minnesotans stay safe. And we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to get into a health club and exercise. And I think health clubs can figure out how to keep people safe and keep people distance. Um, movie theaters are another one that just kind of baffles me that the folks involved with the movie movie theaters are telling us that there hasn't been a single documented case of of COVID transmission in a movie theater in Minnesota or in the entire country, but yet Governor Walls has closed movie theaters in the state of Minnesota. Um, a movie theater is a place where you sit quietly in, a, in, a, in one seat, you don't move, you don't exercise, you, 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 know, you don't breathe heavily, you, you, know, you can wear a mask, um, you can sit with your loved ones from your own household um, and they can uh, structure that so that you sit 20 feet apart from other people. Um, so, you know, I think we're causing um, harm to industries without data to back it up uh, unnecessarily. And I think what the governor should look at, and if I were to, to give him some advice, I would say, let's try to figure out how to get businesses open safely. Let's not let's not try to figure out how to get businesses closed. Um, let's put our effort into trying to figure out how to get our businesses open and do that safely. Because I think with the right steps, I think we, we can um, get these businesses open safely. And that's the best thing for them, frankly. We have to give them less aid and less uh, money to help them through this storm um, if they can actually conduct some business on their own. And, and I think that's the, the most important thing right now. As a follow-up in any package that the legislature might consider, would you pursue maybe as making part of the deal with the governor, reopening health clubs and movie theaters and maybe some others? You know, I, I want the governor to do the right thing and I'm, I'm not about to, to start uh, making ultimatums of we'll give you this if you give us that. Um, I, I think what, what I, and I also don't like the idea that, that House Democrats are saying to Senate Republicans, you know, hey, you have to come with a fully vetted proposal and put that on the table. I'm a little old fashioned. I think that legislators and the governor could sit around a table and say, okay, this is what's going on in our state. Who's being hurt and how are they being hurt? And let's together figure out how to help those people. Um, I, you know, I think, I, I think we could show some leadership and really working together to figure this stuff out. I'm not, I'm not about to put an ultimatum on the governor to say, um, you know, we won't, give give businesses relief or give money to you know extend unemployment benefits or whatever unless you open up health clubs and and movie theaters what we'd like to do is we'd like to be at the table with the governor reviewing the data and saying hey you know what uh movie theaters are telling us there hasn't been a single uh documented case of transmission of covid in a movie theater in the entire country why is it that movie theaters Let's ask the question, how do we keep movie theaters open? Or how do we keep health clubs open? Or how do we keep restaurants open? And, and what I mean by that is what uh, measures could we put in place um, that would make it safe to be in a restaurant and, and allow that business to be open? Um, and I think that's what's important. In the meantime, while businesses are closed, while restaurants are closed, um, go and get takeout. Go and you know, do, do whatever you can to support them in any way that you can, because they are really... Uh, weathering a storm right now, and they could use all of our help and support uh, to get through that. So um, go and go and take take out from your local restaurants, your small businesses, and and help them out. 
Thank you. Great. Uh, Jesse Van Burkle, and then uh, we've got time for one more after that if someone else has a question. Sure, I just wanted to ask about um, proposed cuts. Um, and already laid it out, you had suggested that, that state government should look to cut back instead of raising taxes. Are there certain areas where you're exploring for potential cuts? You know, I think this is one where the, the Democrats, uh, you know, boogeyman, for lack of a better term, is always that we have to raise revenue or we have to make drastic cuts. Um, I, you know, in it, in a, in a re economic recovery like this, I think we all know the disastrous effect that it would have if we raise taxes. Um, we, you know, raising taxes on job creators who are struggling, raising taxes on Minnesota families who are struggling. No one would say to you that that is the the right solution to get out of this with a straight face. Um, and 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 if we don't want to make cuts, the answer is let's grow our way out of this. Um, and there's a lot of other things that we can do to cut red tape and and make it easier to conduct business in Minnesota, make it easier easier to grow our economy um, and, and grow our way out of this. Um, obviously, our, our fiscal situation changed pretty drastically from June or July when that uh, interim forecast came out to today. Um, let's, let's do the things necessary to make Minnesota the most business friendly place so that we can actually grow our way out of this um, so that we don't have to make cuts if that's not what we want to do. But if, if I were to, you know, offered the choice of the only two options were to tax or to cut, um, I think we can find some efficiencies in state government. I think we can use technology to, to find efficiencies. Um, you know, there are things that we're spending an awful lot of money on right now um, that I think most Minnesotans would consider wasteful spending. One of them, just a small example, is that uh, North Star commuter rail. I mean, we've got the, the ridership on that is, is so low right now um, and we're continuing to operate it, and we have mandates that the local governments continue to pay their share of it. Um, we should we should idle that um, and not spend the money to keep that operating when it's really benefiting just a you know a dozen riders or something is is, is how low the ridership is. I mean, there are, if we think that there aren't examples to cut in a fifty billion dollar budget, um, we should we should cut up our election certificates. I'm sure Representative Garofalo, I can see him nodding as I'm speaking, has some ideas as well and would like to chime in. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, thank you, Leader Dowd. And, uh, you know, Jesse, there's a lot of examples of things out there, but obviously a lot of government programs were designed at a time in a pre-COVID world where we were spending money on congestion mitigation. Um, we're in a post-COVID world now, and the reality is that people like working from home, and so we need to have the government transform the way the private sector is right now. Um, I just will be honest. I don't, I think that maybe majority leader Winkler was talking about the old DFL majority. Um, the new DFL majority is a lot smaller and I'm not really sure that they're going to be having a lot of support from uh, their members who won very close elections to advocate for tax increases. But likewise in candor, I don't think you're going to see a lot of support out of the Senate majority uh, for really big spending cuts. Uh, people see that the vaccine is coming. They know that the economy is ready to take off. And so I think you're going to see a lot of motivation that says, hey, let's have a responsible amount of budget reserves. Uh, let's make sure that we get out and help our small businesses to jumpstart the economy. I'm not, I, I, I just don't see any realistic forecast for making uh, difficult, painful choices that are going to be unnecessary when we see the vaccine getting deployed uh, as, as early as this month. All right, we'll take one last question from uh, Esme Murphy. Can you hear me? We got gotcha. you. Okay. Hey, um, just, you know, Leader Dow, can you sort of, are you 100% sure that the legislature will in fact pass some kind of relief package and I realize not all of this is under your control, but uh, are you really confident that something will be passed to help these small businesses? Well, that's a difficult question, Esme, and you've been covering the legislature long enough to know that there is no certainty in anything. Uh, but I, I, I am, I am one hundred percent confident that we can. Um, whether we will or not, uh, you know, remains to be seen. Whether the the players are all at the table sincerely and and want to get something done, um, I can assure you that my caucus, which I which I can speak for, um, is 100% committed to helping Minnesota families and and helping Minnesota businesses. We do support uh, extending the unemployment benefits. Uh, we think that's necessary. We think it's fiscally responsible. Um, we also uh, 
you know, support helping uh, Minnesota businesses, uh, small business owners uh, weather this storm, and, and we're absolutely committed to do that. We think our actions um, have, have really demonstrated that we intend to take the lead on that and, and really uh, be a willing participant with anybody who's willing to talk to us. Uh, we hope the governor um, engages in a meaningful way, and, and frankly, we need to have uh, all of the caucuses committed to getting something done. And, and I, so I, it is absolutely 100% possible. I can't guarantee it because I can only speak for my caucus, but my caucus is committed to getting it done. And I think that's a, a, an important step. Yeah. As may, we, uh, our caucus does not, as Leader Doe has articulated, we're in favor of small business assistance. We don't need anything attached to that to pass it. And so uh, as other stakeholders are trying to attach other things to the small business assistance, I think that's going to determine the success of whether we're able to help small businesses or not. If we can keep it clean and just focused on small businesses, this can be done this week. Uh, if other people are going to put legislative wish lists and attach it to helping our small businesses, then those people are going to be responsible for causing problems. Yeah, I, I would add on to that too. I, I said earlier that we we aren't putting ultimatums on on anything. We we just want to get this done. And and as long as nobody else puts ultimatums onto this, um, I think it absolutely can happen. Where the where the legislature gets into trouble is when we say, you know, I'm not going to do this unless you do that. And um, you know, it, these bills grow into huge monstrosities. Uh, let's focus on who needs the help. And I, I, I frankly, we don't need to all bring our solutions to the table. What we need to do is bring our 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 hearts and and our our commitment to the table to work together um, and sit around the table and and talk together about who actually needs the help, um, and then figure out together what the best approach to help them is. And and yes, we did we did get a little head start in working on this uh, because we we knew how important it is and we're we're really in tune with our constituents who uh, have been contacting us about it. So um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work of uh, Dave Baker and Barb Haley and and others who I should probably shouldn't have mentioned any names because I'm I can't mention them all, but but, um, you know, they have really taken a, a great leadership role in putting together a package uh, to help Minnesota businesses. And they have uh, they have frankly um, just been committed to working with uh, all the other caucuses and talking to um, all of those impacted by this to come up with the right package to get something done that will really make a meaningful difference. So our hope is that we could get it done even this week. Um, and that's our commitment. So uh, we stand stand by ready. All right. Uh, I think that'll do it. Uh, any, uh, Kurt, do you want to wrap up? Uh, any closing thoughts? You know, uh, not necessarily. I just want to thank everybody. Uh, obviously, the, the fiscal situation has improved greatly, which is good news for everyone. Uh, it's especially good news for Minnesotans and, and I think puts us in a much better situation. As we look out on the horizon um, in the next biennium, there still are some concerns about some deficit spending. But uh, the fact that um, our, our forecast has increased uh, or improved so dramatic, dramatically since uh, June and July to now, um, I think uh, bodes well for the future. But I think also how we approach things uh, between now and and the uh, you know kind of full rollout of a vaccine um, is going to determine um, how many businesses are really able to weather the storm. I think many many Minnesota businesses just barely weathered the first set of shutdowns. Uh, that the governor ordered and and now uh, weren't really anticipating a second round and and obviously here we are so um, I want to thank them uh, I want to thank Minnesotans for all the work that they've been doing to get through this and um, I want them to know that we're here listening and and trying to do the best that we can to, to provide the help that that we need so certainly reach out to to the governor's office and to Democrats in the house and let them know how important this is and and let's get it done quickly thanks everybody thank you all